Uh, so first, then, uh, Zechariah 13, uh, verses 4 to 9. This is, this is God's Word. On, on that day, every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. He will not put on a hairy cloak in order to deceive, but he will say, I am, I am no prophet, I am a worker of the soil, for a man sold me in my youth. And if one asks him, what, what are these wounds on your back? He will say, the wounds I received in the house of my friends. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God." And now we turn to, to Matthew's gospel, Matthew uh, 26, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 26, uh, reading verses 26 to 35. Matthew 26, uh, picking up with verse 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. This is God's word. Uh, we give thanks to him uh, for it. Now rise, look to you, our Heavenly Father, uh, for help. As a servant looks to uh, its master, as a maid servant looks to her mistress, so our eyes look to you, O God, and we await mercy, we appeal to you for mercy. And we do ask, Lord, that you would uh, act that we might not be deaf, that we might not be stubborn of heart. Give us ears to hear, hearts that receive your truth. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his name's sake. Amen. Okay, friends, when was the, the last time that you were in the capital city of the UK. When was the last time that you were in London? Okay, maybe it's been uh, a while for some, maybe some have never been uh, to the UK's capital. Whether that's true, whatever it was, architecturally, you will know that London is a pretty fascinating a place to be, largely because of World War II, largely because of the Blitz. One feature of the city of London is the, the variety of its buildings, the variety of its 
uh, architecture. If you, I want you to try this the next time you're in the city of London. So you're walking along the street in London. Stop, not too abruptly. Uh, stop, look across the road, look up and take in what you will see. Because very often in London, what you will see are buildings that are sitting next to each other of greatly contrasting architectural styles. So in London, what you'll find is a glorious ancient building. <laughs> but what you'll find is it sitting smack by next door uh, to some modernist or brutalist monstrosity of a, of a building. So if you're in London, you're walking about London architecturally, what do you find? You find beauty and you find real ugliness and they're sitting next door to each other. They are side by side. Well, this morning, as you and I turn into Matthew chapter 26, that's actually what we find. So today is like you and I are walking uh, the streets of London. You see, our text that we're opening to, it is absolutely full, chock a block of what are stark juxtapositions. Rarely in Scripture, I think it's fair to say, rarely in Scripture do we find such abhorrent ugliness, as we see with the disciples here, and we see it right next door to that which is stunningly beautiful, as we see in the Lord Jesus. But since attention in Matthew 26 has turned from the purpose of Jesus' death to what his death is going to mean for his disciples, his followers, whether this morning it is really ugly or whether it is beautiful, everything in this text is for us and to help us live more for the glory and the honor of the Lord Jesus. So beauty and ugliness side by side. So we're walking the streets of London. Can I invite you, uh, friends, to please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 26. Matthew chapter 26, and really looking from verse 30 to 35. So if you've got it, if you can get it in your phone, if you can get it in a copy of the Bible, Matthew 26 uh, from verse 30. And first of all, let's think about uh, the prophecy of abandonment that we see here. The prophecy of abandonment. Prophecy of abandonment. Okay, where were we? Can you think back to last Sunday? Can you remember? Can you recall where we were? That's right. Jesus and his disciples were in the upper room. And Jesus has just this minute, he has instituted the Lord's Supper, explaining as he has done that, the atoning nature and the sacrificial nature of his own death. Well, do you know, by this point here in the text, it is perhaps about 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night at this moment here. And this group in the upper room, they're about to go down the stairs, if you like, and they're about to go out into the night together. But just before they do that, do you notice this little detail we're given in verse 30? Before they go out, listen to this, they sung a hymn together. Just, if you'll allow me a little aside, isn't that absolutely wonderful when you, when you realize what is happening here? This is Jesus. This is God incarnate, and he's in song, and he's singing with his people. Isn't it beautiful? You, you must understand as well that the most likely this is what we probably call antiphonal song. So this is uh, back and forth, back and forth. It was traditional in the, in the Passover for the head of the household to take uh, the, the latter part of what is called the Egyptian Hallel so it's the, it probably about Psalm 115 to 118 that you have just sung just now, and it was traditional for the, the head of the household to take this, and what he would do is he would begin the singing. 
So he would lead the singing, and then the group of the Passover, they would respond, and it would go back and forward and back and forward. It is a lovely thought, isn't it? Just an aside, here is the Prince of Glory, and he is singing praises to his beloved Father, and it's echoed by his, his people's song. It's lovely. But then what? Well, then they go out into the night. And after what is probably about a 15 or 20 minute walk to the east of the city, slightly elevated, do you notice where they get to? They, they go, they arrive at the Mount of Olives. And maybe as they, well, let's speculate, maybe as they get comfortable, maybe they sit up with this elevated view over the city, maybe it's at that point quiet falls in the group. Jesus begins to speak. And yet again here, did you notice that Jesus says something that is incredibly shocking, something shocking. Now, before we get to that, I just want to ask whether English was a strong suit for you uh, in your education. Was English, think back, was English one of your favorite subjects? Yes or no? Well, whether it was or not, it doesn't really matter. But I'm sure that a lot of you can remember in English, having to do textual analysis. Do you remember this? For an essay, analyzing a text for an exam, perhaps? Some of you are having nightmares this morning about that, aren't you? Well, believe it or not, I think that's what we need to do here. I want your attention, please, just to be in the way that Scripture has put together and constructed the grammar. And if we look at verse 31 together. Look at verse 31 with me. If we can put that up. Now, skim read that. I want, I want us, so textual analysis. I want us just to notice just one or two things about this. First of all, I want your attention, please, to be on the verb that Jesus uses, the verb. What does he say? And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. Now, do you know that that right at the root of that word is, is taken from the idea of an animal trap? So it is the idea of something that causes us to trip up or just to, to, to fall, to, to stumble. But the reality is that in the Bible, uh, that word has this big, wide, semantic range. So see that idea there? It can't just mean a little blip when we're talking about discipleship. But that idea of falling away, it can also mean this, it can mean a full and complete apostasy. And when you look at this, it does seem to be that Jesus uses it in a really strong sense. So not quite a complete apostasy. We're not far off it. I'm asking you to, to think about that for a moment. What's happening here, just in the Mount of Olives? Jesus is revealing that in just no time at all, listen to this word, all of those men are going to defect. That's the idea, isn't it? Like all of those men, Jesus is revealing, you are all going to abandon me. And it's something, if you've got a Bible, just flick into verse 56. This is something that is just in a blink of an eye, and then just in a matter of, what will we say, minutes, moments, it's something that is, is fulfilled. Verse 56, if you don't have a Bible, it says this, then all the disciples left him and they fled. That's a horrible verb, isn't it? So we've got the verb, but well, let's keep going with our textual analysis. I want you to think about the emphasis in the language here. Because let's go for a scenario, Christian friends, okay? So let's say that tomorrow, this might actually be true for some of you, but let's say tomorrow you have an email to write. Uh, uh, you have a strongly worded email uh, to write to somebody tomorrow, okay? Now, you need in that email to draw attention or emphasis to, to something, what are you going to do in that email? There's lots of ways that we can do that in English, aren't there? We can repeat something, can't we? Repeat it over and over again to drum it into that person. Or we can maybe just underline it. Or if you're in a really terrible mood, 
When you get up out of your bed tomorrow and you write that email, you can even just use capital letters, can't you? That'll get the point across, right? You're emphasizing it. Well, in the Bible, it's different, obviously. But if you wanted to stress something in the biblical language here in Greek, this is what you would do. You would take the words, the relevant words, and you wouldn't underline it. What you would do is you would bring it to the front of the clause, to the front of the sentence. And so I want you to, again, look at verse 31. Now think about that. So instead of what might be the regular and expected, instead of this very night you will all fall away, what is brought to the front of the, of the clause? Jesus says to the disciples, you will all fall away. Do you, do you see what Jesus is saying? He's looking at these men in the eye and he's saying to them, you of all people are going to abandon me. Where others may stay closer to the cross, where others may linger to look on, you of all people, like the, the ones who have been with me and the ones who have been loved by me, you are the ones who are going to flee and abandon me. Isn't it, isn't it something? Isn't it awful? Having already had one of the disciples resolve to betray him, Jesus now sees and says that the rest of them will soon desert him, and they're going to do it at the hour of his greatest need. So we see the verb and, and we see the emphasis, but uh, do you know what? Brace yourselves, oh, friends, brace yourselves, because you're just about to get a flashback, and it's going to be a flashback to your, to your O grade or your standard grade or your Nat 5 English class, because uh, in addition, I really want us just to notice the form of a verb. That's a phrase that I never thought I would say from the pulpit, but I do want you to notice the form of a verb. See, consider, I'm glad it's still up on the screen here, because consider the second part of verse 31. Now, do you see what Jesus does in the second part? So, he quotes Zechariah. And that's, that's a book, if you've been here for the sermon series, you know that's a book that Matthew has mentioned already, hasn't he, Zechariah? I find that interesting. So Zechariah is clearly something, a book that is pivotal in our Lord's uh, messianic self-understanding. But it's a bit different here, isn't it? This time it's Zechariah 13. Now, does everybody get the picture? What is it? It's a picture of a, from Zechariah, it's a picture of a shepherd, and it's a good shepherd. But this is a shepherd who is struck, and what happens is that that striking of the shepherd, it causes all of the sheep and all of the flock to scatter and to flee and abandon the shepherd. Now, I think you can, with me, you can get that picture quite easily. What I'm really interested to know is whether anyone got the anomaly in the language here. I think, I think we can... We can can help you here. Look, look at the, the top phrase. So that the Hebrew of Zechariah is uh, just as you've got it rendered on the screen, really. So the Hebrew reads what? How does it begin, friends? Strike the shepherd. But did you notice what Jesus did? When Jesus alludes to that, when he quote, quotes Zechariah, what Jesus does is he changes the verb form. Do you notice? Then he changes it from strike to I will strike. Now, do you see what Jesus is doing? Jesus is drawing attention to the one who actually will strike the shepherd. He, he draws attention to the one who, who does the striking. And I want to ask you, who was that in Zechariah 13? Listen carefully. Who is it that strikes the shepherd? But it was none other than God himself who struck the shepherd in Zechariah, none other in Zechariah 13 than the Lord of hosts. Do you see what's happening in the Mount of Olives? Jesus here at this pivotal moment, this crucial moment, he wants the disciples to understand who will be sovereignly active in these coming events. He wants these men around him to know he's not a victim of chance, a victim of fate. He wants them to understand everything that's about to happen. 
It's by God's decree. Think about that. His coming arrest, his coming trial, his coming death. And crucially, he wants them to understand even their cowardly response, their fleeing abandonment. All of it, the whole picture is part of the unfolding plan of an almighty and sovereign God. And I think, honestly, I do think that that should be of great encouragement to us in this room, because I know this, I believe this, that some people in here this morning will have come into this room nearly broken. Some people will come into this room and are just so affected by trial and the troubles, and, and there's some people amongst us today, and they will, they will be struggling to converse, and they will be struggling to concentrate, and if that is you, do you see what you must do? This morning in here, you, you, you must cling to the logic of the gospel, the logic of God's sovereign care. Think about it. If God, our Father, if He was sovereignly in control, even over all of the events around Jesus' death, does that not mean that God just now is even reigning over your present worries and mine? Do you see this, the logic of God's sovereign care? Can we not trust Him? Like, must we not trust God with our present concerns if our Father was even in control, complete control, even as these men, these chosen, beloved disciples, even as they abandoned His only begotten Son? So we see the, a prophecy or the prophecy of abandonment. Second, though, we see the promise of restoration. Last Sunday, um, I know we've got a few visitors, but you'll uh, allow me to reflect on last Sunday. Uh, last Sunday in here, I asked uh, the congregation in passing uh, to think about your favorite uh, Bible passages or your favorite moments in Scripture. And I, I do wonder uh, what comes to your mind or what came to your mind when you thought about that. Um, for me, one of my favorite portions of Scripture is from the book of Genesis. Maybe strangely, it's Genesis 3, but maybe not so surprisingly, it's Genesis 3.15. And lots of you know that verse, don't you? And you know what happens in Genesis 3.15. There is the fall, there's the rebellion, there is the plunging of humanity into sinful nature. But then what happens? God acts, God speaks, and God promises that there will be a seed of a woman who will go on to crush the serpent's head immediately. And I think that's, that's for me, that's, that's the beauty of it all. Immediately in the face of this rebellion and sin, immediately in Genesis 3, God is there with this promise of blessing and this promise of grace. It is beautiful, isn't it? And I also think that in this text before you, you have something similar to that. So let's look at verse 32 with me, verse 32. Now, yeah, I suppose if, as you look at that, you can see, can you, the certainty of Jesus' resurrection? What's that first phrase? Can you read it there with me? Um, but Jesus says to these men, but after I am raised up... <laughs> I've been smiling about that uh, phrase for most of the week. It's the third time that Jesus has predicted his resurrection to the disciples, but don't you just love how absolutely sure Jesus is of his coming resurrection? Uh, what's made me smile is the fact that he is so sure of, so certain about his resurrection that he doesn't even speak about it directly. Do you, do you see that? He, he speaks about it just in passing. He's so certain of his resurrection that he, he's saying, uh, after I'm raised up, so he, indirectly, after, this, after I'm raised up, this other thing happens. Isn't it amazing? So certain is he. Such faith. But if we concentrate on that, I think we much more should concentrate on the promise he makes. So have a look at the second half of of the verse. I'll ask you to do this. Just don't, don't do it out, uh, out loud, Christian friends, but please just repeat the second part to yourself in your head. What does it say? 
Jesus says to them, I will go before you to Galilee. Can you do it again in your head? I will go before you to Galilee. Humor me. Do it one more time. I will go before you to Galilee. As you, as you linger on that, I wonder what questions you have. Perhaps it is that some of us ask, well, why, why Galilee? Why Galilee? Why Galilee? It's actually uh, particular to Matthew's gospel, where the other gospels, they focus on Jesus' post-resurrection fellowship with the disciples in Jerusalem. But what does Matthew do? Matthew looks beyond that, and he looks to Galilee. And of course, now, it's Matthew's gospel. So how has he previously referred to that? It's Galilee of the Gentiles, isn't it? So can you see what's going on? Jesus instructs them to go to Galilee. Let's be frank, because the work of the gospel was incomplete. Soon, and in Galilee of the Gentiles, a great commission was going to be given by Jesus and to them. And what was the great commission? It was to go from Galilee of the Gentiles out into all nations with this glorious news of salvation in Jesus Christ. Go to Galilee. There's work to be done. But perhaps you've still got that phrase going around in your head, do you? Can you think about what that means? Think about the promise that Jesus is making. Think about what that promise necessitates. I will go before you to Galilee. What is Jesus saying? Is this not a promise, yes, of forgiveness? That if they are to go to Galilee, surely this means that in time they're going to be forgiven for abandoning Jesus. It definitely means forgiveness, but does it not mean more than that? Because how does it start? Jesus says to those men, I will go before you. I will go. He's promising to meet these men. Isn't that amazing? They have abandoned him. They've fled from him. They've let him down. They've proven to be completely untrue to Jesus. And he's saying, no, I promise you, there's going to be restoration. This is the promise of a restored relationship. And I want you to get something that is utterly amazing. So I want to ask you to do this with me. Will you pick up your Bible and jump to Matthew chapter 28 and verse 7? Matthew chapter 28, verse 7. Now you've all still got that phrase banging around in your head, don't you? I will go before you to Galilee, the promise of restoration. Matthew 28, verse 7. As you, as you, as you get there, understand what's happening. So in Matthew 28, 7, Jesus is risen from the dead. He's risen. And an angel appears to the women. <laughs> and what, do, what is it that the angel is instructed to say? The angel has to restate this promise about going out to Galilee. Do you see? It's almost as though God's grace of, and this promise of restoration is almost as though it's going to be too good to believe. Do you see? And then if you do this, look into verse 10, Matthew 28, verse 10. It becomes all the more remarkable because Jesus now meets those women. And Jesus himself speaks to them. And what does he do? He again restates that promise. It's as though Jesus is saying, it is really, really true. Go and tell those men that they are forgiven. Go and tell those men that though they have been unfaithful, I never will be unfaithful. That restoration with Jesus is not just possible. It is happening. Go and tell them. And I wonder, Christian friend, if you can see how encouraging and helpful that is for us. In the devotional reading this week, I think it was the day before yesterday, I read that familiar verse that you know well from Hebrews, the verse that says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. A Christian friend, can you, can you see what that means? That means that 
as God always was, as Jesus always was, right now and here, Jesus is the one who delights to show mercy. Right now, Jesus is the one who loves to forgive sin. Do you need to hear that, Christian friend? As Chris prayed earlier on, as you're in here just now, are you incredibly troubled by your sin? As you look at these disciples, are you seeing your reflection? Are you seeing something of your waywardness or your cowardness or the fact that you are prone to abandon Jesus at the drop of a hat? Do you see that? Is, is that you? Do you now recognize where you must go? Even in this very moment in prayer, go to Galilee. Go to your waiting Lord. For Jesus is risen. Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for your sin. Forgiven. And Jesus, Christian friend, Jesus is ready to pour out upon you the blessings of a restored relationship. He's waiting for you. Will you not, in prayer, go to Galilee and go to your loving, your gracious, your merciful, your waiting Savior? And then the last thing that we'll see is the problem of pride. The problem of pride. We've, uh, I suppose we've been walking the streets of London uh, this morning, have we? Getting the steps in. And we've been admiring architecture, or certainly noting the architecture. We've seen that which is so filthy and ugly. The fact that the disciples are set to abandon Jesus, that's ugliness. But that has been right up next door to what is beautiful, and that is the grace and the mercy of the living God. But I've got to warn you, just as we close, uh, the reality is that there's something ugly. There's another ugly modernist building to look at because as he is so prone to doing, Peter speaks up in, these, in this portion of Scripture. And so let's look at that. Look at verse 33. Verse 33, Peter speaks up. The, uh, the 16th century reformer, John Calvin, uh, he once famously said this uh, about a, a question that the disciples asked. So I think it was in Acts chapter 1, the disciples asked Jesus about the coming of the kingdom. And they ask a pretty daft question to Jesus. And then Calvin, in his notes, Calvin writes this. <laughs> he says, there are as many errors in this question as there are words. <laughs> that is brutal. Isn't that brutal? There are as many errors in this question as words. Some of the parents in here have heard of wanted to say that to their children in the past when they come with a stupid question, don't they? There are as many errors in this question as words. Friends, the same thing could be said about Peter here. And what I want to do to draw this to a conclusion is really just to list the errors that Peter makes. And I'll tell you why. Because each of these errors is instructive for us in the Christian life. We are prone to making these errors. So you've got the text there. First, notice that Peter shows disbelief in God's Word. Can you see that? He shows disbelief in God's Word. I mean, you think about, for a moment, who speaks here, but Jesus speaks in verse 31. Now, think about that. God incarnate. He utters this infallible prophecy about the disciples falling away. And, and how does Peter respond? He says, to God incarnate, he says, never. He says, that is not true. God speaks, God's word speaks. And Peter effectively says, I do not believe it. And that is a place you and I must never get to. So he shows disbelief. A second thing that he does, though, is he shows disdain for his fellow believers. Now, I think you can see that more clearly, can you? I mean, just think about what Peter doesn't say. Verse 31, Jesus says, you are all going to fall away. And, G and Peter doesn't respond and say, no, we're not. 
We're not, we're not going to fall away. Peter doesn't say that. What does Peter say? He says, <laughs> Peter says, I'm not going to fall away, but see these other guys here. I think very much that they probably will fall away. Isn't that it? Isn't that the, I'm, well, I'm not going to fall away, but see these other blokes. Yeah, they're, they're going to, they're, they're, yeah, I totally believe that they could fall away. Peter does hear what we are prone to doing. Peter does hear what we must never do, though. And he looks down upon and he speaks up against his fellow believers. He shows disbelief. He shows disdain. Thirdly, though, he shows dependence. And his dependence upon himself. And I, and I know that definitely you can see that in the text. You can all see that there is pride. Spiritual pride here. What does he say? Oh, I will, I will never do that. I like how one writer puts it, one commentator says this, that Peter shows faith, but it is faith only in his own faith, doesn't he? The idea is, yes, okay, tonight very well may bring temptation to flee. There might be temptation to abandon you, Jesus, but what does Peter think? He is confident in his own love for Jesus, his own devotion to Jesus, his own commitment to Jesus. I won't yield to that temptation. And yet, if you and I were to read on, what do we find? Just in a matter of hours, what will, what will he do before the rooster crows? He will not just abandon Jesus. He will fall even further than the rest of the disciples. And he will actually, he will deny Jesus and he will do it a full three times. And so if you and I are walking the streets of London together, you can see where we, we get to here. We're surely at the bright lights of Piccadilly Circus or Leicester Square, because is this not true? Is Peter not writ large in flashing neon lights as a warning? And a warning in the church down the centuries, and a warning to you, and a warning to me of the utter danger of spiritual pride. We must not think that we are strong in and of ourselves, Christian friend. We must not think like that. What does the Apostle Paul say? He says, let anyone who thinks that he stands, let him take heed lest he fall. Apart from God's strength, Christian friend, you are nothing. You are weaker than you understand. You are weaker than, than you know. We must be daily appealing to Jesus Christ for his help in the face of temptation and for his spirit. And then we, we close with this. Peter has shown disbelief, disdain, dependence, but he also shows a deafness to Jesus. Because I think there's, a, there's an odd detail here, isn't there? I wonder if we can, if you just look at this, the fuller text, 31 to 33, now you're going to think that I'm mad, but wait for me. Do you notice something? Do you, is it not true that if you were to remove the middle verse, verse 32, so if you were to take out what Jesus says about restoration and Galilee and all that, that phrase that we've been memorizing, if you were to take that out, does this sound crazy? That this text would flow better if you took out that promise about Jesus going to Galilee, it would almost make more sense. Now, listen to me, see if you get it. Jesus says, you are all going to fall away Take out, take out verse 32. You are all going to fall away. And Peter says, I will never do that. It almost flows better. Why does it flow better? Listen. Because it's almost as though Peter did not hear verse 32. Do you understand? He only hears this stinging prophecy of abandoning his Lord. He only hears that and it injures his pride. And it's almost as though Peter just does not have ears to hear what Jesus, what else he is saying. He misses the promise of restoration. He misses the promise of forgiveness. And so if you are in this room or listening online and you're not a Christian, I, I am urging 
urging you to think about that and not to make the same mistake. And I'll tell you this, it is a mistake that has been made by countless thousands of people in churches up and down the country and throughout the centuries. What's the mistake? We hear the diagnosis of Scripture, that we are rebels against God. That injures people's pride, doesn't it? We don't like hearing that. And what does it mean? It means that we stop up our ears. We don't listen to what else God offers in the gospel. I urge you, don't be like that. Hear it this morning, that at Calvary, Christ has paid the penalty for your sin. Hear that. Hear Jesus himself invite you to him. Come, he says, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And Jesus says, I will give you rest. Do you hear it? Friend, we walk the streets of London. We arrive where we always, always, always arrive. And we end up here at King's Cross. (laughs) No. We arrive at the King's Cross, don't we? Friend, please understand that at Calvary, what you see is the place of forgiveness and salvation. It is a place of both ugliness and great unspeakable beauty. And if you've never done it this morning, will you not bow there and bow there to Jesus Christ? Friends, let's pray.